Hello, so in this video I'm going to talk through the um, exam technique for the interpretations question um, for paper one, which is on Britain 1625 to 1701. Um, this is section C of the exam, and it's always going to be on an aspect of topic five. So this is a compulsory part of um, paper one. Um, so it's very, very important that you get your head around this and you feel confident with these questions. Um, before I get into this, I should say that this is the one that actually students tend to do the best on, um, almost of all of the questions in the exam. So the exam board gives us a breakdown as ha of how well everybody's done in, in all of the exam papers. And actually, this is one that we tend to get the highest marks in. Um, I think that because the, the interpretations do quite a lot of the work for you and you're responding to them as opposed to just writing an essay you know just coming up with it all by yourself so this is something that hopefully you should be confident on and you're focusing on historical interpretations of the glorious revolution as i said and you can see the little picture there of uh, ted valancey's book the glorious revolution which is a book i would strongly recommend that you have a read of if you want to get your head around this in uh detail you know going beyond the textbook it's a very good it's a very book all about the glorious revolution okay so getting stuck into this in terms of these questions um generally there are four areas that that you can be asked on obviously the exam board might think of something that's a little bit more specific than this and these are very broad but i think if you plan your revision around these four kind of overarching questions usually you will cover you will have covered it for topic five so before we get into how to answer the questions, just think about these things and maybe get your head around evidence from this topic. So the first key question is about the power balance between the monarch and parliament and the extent to which the glorious revolution changed that. So did things, the question could be something like, did, did the monarch's power remain the same? Did parliament become more powerful than the monarch? Um, and it might be just on the revolution settlement, so the, the Bill of Rights. Um, or it could be broader across the whole time frame. So make sure you've got a good understanding about the, the power balance between the monarch and parliament and how that changes following the Glorious Revolution up to 1701. The next question is about the end of, end of Anglican supremacy. So it's mainly talking about the Toleration Act. And what you'll need to do there is think back to topics one and two and think about the uh, state of affairs in terms of religion earlier on um, and and the kind of religious policies and conflict earlier on in the course and then compare that to what we know uh, happens during this period 1688 to 1701. Uh, the next key question is on the extent to which there was a financial revolution in this period. So thinking about the, the financial changes that were brought about so things like the Bank of England, for example. And I think the key aspect of that is thinking about why, you know, a financial revolution happened as well. And it largely comes down to the nine years war. So just having an understanding that that was kind of like driving this and the government's moved towards kind of more efficient government. Um, and so just thinking about examples to kind of support that. And then finally, there's a bigger question to all of this is overall how revolutionary was the glorious revolution so, so just a broader question about you know how are we defining revolution what do we think about the key changes that happened between 1688 and 1701 and can we call it a revolution um just before i get into the exam technique also obviously we teach you about the different schools of thought so the whig view the marxist view and the revisionist view you've got to be clear that you don't actually need to mention those in your answers. The examiners aren't expecting you to mention those. And you could have a, an extract from somebody, for example, Christopher Hill, who you should know is a Marxist, but the actual extract itself may not be giving a Marxist interpretation. It, it's just a paragraph from a whole book. So, it, so don't feel like you have to kind of shoehorn in the different historical schools of thought. You can still get 20 out of 20 without doing that. So really don't, don't 
do that unless you really think it's very helpful with your answer. Um, we just teach you about the different schools of short thought to show you that there are different interpretations about the glorious revolution. OK, right. So on to the overall structure and then I'll go into this in more detail. So you do not need an intro for this question. And I've had this confirmed by an examiner um, that you they're not expecting an intro. You can just get stuck, you know, straight into the into the different extracts. So the way you should structure it is two uh, paragraphs. Uh, so one on each extract. So the first paragraph paragraph on one extract, the second paragraph on the other extract. And what you're doing is you're summarizing the, the argument of the extract in your point. You're picking out uh, a key quote to illustrate the argument. Then you're using your own knowledge to either support or challenge that view. OK, and aim for, you know, I would aim for three kind of quotes from the extract per paragraph. Again, if you, you know, if you can only think of two, if you can only find two, that's fine. You know, um, some of them may be more straightforward than others. But try and find evidence to support or challenge them. And then you kind of analyze them. So therefore, how convincing are those views? The key word in the question is, you know, how convincing. So just keep on coming back to that. And then a summary at the end of each paragraph. Overall, how convincing is that view? And then you do a conclusion, which is the most convincing? And then to get to the top level, what you've got to try and do is highlight some differences. So what are the differences between the two interpretations? And for year 13, who've done coursework, this is a bit like section C, isn't it? Where you're thinking about why do they differ? So this is, that might help you as you're reading through it, think, oh, you know, the first extract is only focused on 1688 and 89 the second extract is going all the way to 1701 or maybe this extract is defining revolution in one way and the second extract is defining it in another way so try and bring that into the conclusion so you're kind of weighing them up and saying um which is most convincing and why do they differ okay that's what you need to do to get to level five OK, so here is Simon Sharma, just to remind us all when we're doing the Section C interpretations question, it is not a source question. OK, do not discuss provenance. Do not discuss nature, origin, purpose. That is not what we need to do here. Um, you're focusing on, as Simon Sharma says, you're focusing on the arguments of the historians. OK, please don't get into this one was written before this one that, you know, this historian is a Marxist. This one is a way that's not the focus of this. The focus is the, is the argument itself. OK, so do not fall into the trap of trying to answer this like a source question. It's an interpretations question. The source questions are in French Revolution and civil rights. This is an interpretations question. So please take on board this key advice from Simon Sharma. OK, so as I said, no introduction. So here is the structure of each paragraph. So a clear point what the historian is saying, what the extract is saying, and you can refer to them either by the surname or just extract one. I'd probably say the surname is better. Overall, what are they saying? Then give a quote to illustrate the view. So the overall argument in the historian in extract one is this. We can see this in this quote. You give a quote. By this, they mean, so you explain it, then you would say this can be supported by the fact that give some own knowledge or this can be challenged by the fact that dot, dot, dot. therefore overall this claim is convincing or not okay and as you can see on the right hand side of this slide here aim to do that three times with a summary at the end so in a basic sense you're just doing a point uh quote evidence judgment that's really what you're doing try and do that three times then overall how convincing is this interpretation so if you for example you know you could you might kind of agree with the first part uh, agree with the second part but disagree with the third part for the first um extract for the second extract you might agree for the first part disagree and then disagree because that's based on your own knowledge so overall extract one is more convincing because you've you've had more agreement yeah so that's what you need to do so here is an example 
And this question is, in light of differing interpretations, how convincing do you find the view that, as a result of the Glorious Revolution, Parliament became preeminent in the gov government of the country? And for this question, sometimes people say, I don't know what preeminent means. What would I do in the exam if it's something I don't know? You know, it's a phrase I don't use. The key thing to do is not panic. Just read through the extract. These kind of points come from the extract. You will get a sense of what that means. Preeminent, more important. You will get that if you read that through this, uh, if you read through the extract. So here is just, I'm just going to read part of this paragraph and then you can pause it and go through uh, the rest of it. It isn't quite the whole paragraph because it wouldn't fit on here, but I'll just go through the first part. Hoppe argues in his interpretation that Parliament became preeminent in the government of the country. So really clearly, this is what they say. The source states that Parliament became preeminent. OK, so this is the quote. Clearly illustrating Hoppe's overall view that parliamentary power did increase as a result of the Glorious Revolution. So explaining what that means. The 1694 Triennial Act is a, an example of Parliament's ga uh, gain of power. The Act meant that Parliament had to be called every three years, making absolutism impossible and ending any chance of William's emergence as a personal ruler. From this, is, it's, it is clear that things within government had significantly changed since the reign of Charles I, who ruled without Parliament personal rule 1629-40. Although veto, vetoed by William in 1693, Parliament forced the King's hand in passing the Act, showing their growing power over the monarchy even before the Act was passed. The Triennial Act illustrates the change in role of Parliament within the government of Britain. It is evident that their power was significantly increased over the monarchy in response to this act becoming legislation. So that one does go into it in a lot of detail. You might have not might not have time to go into it in that much detail, but you can see the structure is very clear. Clear point using a, uh, a quote from the extract and then, you know, in this case, it's supporting that with own knowledge. And what it's good to do is linking back to one of the previous uh, topics. So in this case, it's going all the way back to topic one, talking about Charles the First. One or topic two, I think, would be would be very relevant as well in, in a lot of these questions. So obviously now you can pause it and read through the rest of that. As I say, it's not the whole paragraph, but hopefully you get a good sense of what you need to do. All right, hopefully you've, pa uh, you've paused that and you've read through it. Um, and now we're going to go into the conclusion. So, so actually, before I go into the conclusion, obviously you do two paragraphs, one on each extract weighing them up using your own knowledge. So in conclusion, you just answer the overall question, which view is most convincing? So overall, and, and really the conclusion is not as much about your view as it is about which view is most convincing. So it's not necessarily for you to say overall, you know, Parliament did become preeminent. It's like the view that Parliament became preeminent put forward by Hoppet is the most convincing view. That's the way to do it. It's not really your, uh, it, it's not your argument. It's using the arguments of the extracts, okay? Um, and then to get to the top level, as I said before, you need to mention the differences between the interpretations. So what are the differences? Is it the scope? Is it the definitions? Is it the use of evidence, etc.? So here is an exemplar. Um, in conclusion, although both interpretations hold some value, Hoppitz is superior, showing how through compromise and the ultimate power of parliament held by having invited William to invade the country in an unprecedented act of control, the role of Parliament during the Glorious Revolution was indeed preeminent. So really clearly answering the question and saying that th this view is the most convincing. Moral comparatively gives a sweeping statement that full decision making re uh, remained with the monarch, completely ignoring the relevance of policy from the Bill of Rights to the Settlement Act. Um, however, Hoppet fails to mention the weakness of the Bill of Rights or the precedent set by the rebellions of Parliament earlier in the century uh, through both the vetoing of legislation and civil war. So it, it is getting into the differences between them there, isn't it? That moral is leaving things out. OK, so really, really clearly coming down on one side and kind of weighing them up. So, again, if you want to read through that on your own, you can pause it and just read through that. So hopefully you've paused it and read through it. Now I'm just going to go through some key tips for the exam. For this interpretations question, the section C question, um, you need to plan this in good detail. For the 
regular essays, we always say, you know, five minutes planning, 40 minutes writing. For these section C interpretations questions, I would say it's at least 10 minutes of planning and then, uh, or 10 to 15 minutes of planning, and then, you know, 35 to 30 minutes of writing. Um, they are slightly shorter answers because you don't need to do an introduction. Um, and I would follow this, this kind of structure for doing it. So I'd read the question really carefully and highlight what the focus is. Okay, what are we focusing on? And maybe thinking back to those key questions that I did at the start of this video, is it about the power of monarch parliament? Is it about religion? Is it about financial revolution? Uh, is it about how revolutionary? So what are we talking about here? Then I'd carefully read through the extracts and try and do two things. So number one, pull out the overall view. What is the overall argument of this extract? Okay, and maybe summarize it in a bullet point next to it, just really, really briefly. Then um, pull out two or three key quotes that you can use to illustrate their view, illustrate that overall argument. Then you've got to think of your own knowledge that you can use to support or challenge the views of the extracts. And maybe think of your own argument. What do you think? Which one is it? Which one are you most uh, convinced by? OK, so um, I hope that's clear uh, and it's giving you uh, a good idea of how to answer those interpretations questions uh, in paper one. All right. Thanks.